Hey everybody, Nick here. It's Monday night. Here we are on Davis Park Church of Christ YouTube channel. We do this every uh, Monday night, every Thursday night, and effort to stay connected to the Word of Souls to God, to His Word, and to prayer. I am going to be in Matthew chapter 24 this evening. If you want to grab your Bible and meet me there, we're going to be talking about a... A verse that is sometimes used in discussion in order to maybe try and stump us. And I'm hoping that uh, tonight we can put together a, a reasonable response uh, to the challenges that some people may bring to us. But before we get there, I have a song picked out here. Let's worship our God in song. I'll be back in just a minute. Lord, I lift your name on high. campaign from yesteryear, back when Bo Jackson was doing his thing, both in football and in baseball. Baseball first, and then he decided that, kind of like how other guys have hobbies, he played he played football as a hobby in the offseason of baseball. Bo Jackson, just a, a phenomenal athlete. But they ran an ad campaign. When, when he was at the height of his career, Bo knows. And it showed Bo, he knows baseball. Bo knows football. Bo knows hockey. Bo knows guitar. I think at one point in the, you, you can probably look this up on YouTube, the, ad, uh, the advertisement, the commercial, where he's playing a guitar. Although I think if I recall right, he's kind of playing it poorly. But Bo knows. Bo knows. And the idea was, Bo, there isn't anything that Bo doesn't know how to do well. He can play any sport uh, and uh, pick up anything. And, and of course, he demonstrated that uh, multiple times on the field, doing feats that are kind of once-in-a-generation type of uh, feats on the playing field, both in baseball and football. Well, what's interesting tonight, our text here, Matthew 24, is when it comes to Jesus, you know, we can talk about Jesus knows. Jesus knows even more than Bo knows, right? Jesus knows what Bo don't know, okay? Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows when we hurt. Jesus knows the struggles that we go through. Jesus knows what it's like to be human and to experience temptation, and Jesus knows what it is to die, but also to rise from the dead. Jesus knows, to an even greater degree than Bo knows, right? However, our text here this evening, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, uh-oh, it looks like there is something that Jesus don't know. 
Matthew 24, 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. No one knows. Can I just stop there briefly and say this? A decade ago, it was Mr. Harold Camping. And since Harold Camping made headline news and kind of had his 15 minutes of fame uh, with his predictions, and then, of course, they turned out to be failed predictions, really haven't been too many <coughs> date setters of late. Don't worry, I've got my four-part date setter series in my back pocket anytime that someone wants to step up and, and try and claim that they know the day and the hour. Harold Camping had uh, a very specific formula mathematically that he'd worked out. Here's the thing. You may not even recognize the name Harold Camping anymore because he, he was a blip on the radar, came and went. There are always these folks who show up from time to time who claim to know. Jesus here tells us, no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. No one, no human being knows. No matter what they try to say, no matter how much mathematics they may try to cram in front of you, no matter how much Bible code trivia they may have, no one knows that hour and day. Now, what hour and day are we talking about? I guess we should back up here even further. Uh, the day and the hour. What day and hour? And it's a specific day. That day and hour. The context for Matthew chapter 24 starts way back earlier in the opening verses. And Jesus has just pronounced a number of woes on the religious leaders of his day in Matthew chapter 23. And as they're leaving Jerusalem, Jesus left the temple. He was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So as they're leaving the temple, the disciples are like, Look, Jesus, look here. Look at all this cool stuff. And Jesus answered them. He answered them. You see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This impressive temple structure that you're geeking out about, it's going kaput. It's going away. And so he sat on the Mount of Olives. Interesting. Sitting is the position of the teacher. Back in their day, he was getting ready to teach them. He, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What things? Well, when not one stone left upon another. When, it will, when will these things of, well, the destruction of the temple take place? What will be the sign of your coming, that is, Christ's coming to bring judgment upon the not just the, the Jerusalem state, the, the nation for the rejection, but also the coming for his, uh, his, his judgment, his final judgment upon the whole sacrificial system and the temple ritual cult. And of the end of the age, that is the end of the Jewish age, uh, it's still yet 40 years future from when they're asking these questions, but the end of the age of the Jerusalem state. It's not talking about the end of the world. Okay? It is the end of the world as they know it, because their whole world revolves around uh, the, the temple. I mean, that was supposed to be the place of the presence of God and all that. And so when will be the end of that age? And so Jesus begins to unpack. There's a lot to unpack here in Matthew 24 that is for another time, but he begins to answer their question for when it will be that uh, they'll see the abomination of desolation. That is a Gentile standing where they ought not to be, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Uh, that had happened before. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV had desolated the temple back in the 2nd century B.C. And then uh, there was a Roman general who came on the scene in the middle of the 1st century and uh, B.C., and he likewise conquered Jerusalem, and one of the spoils of war, he wanted to go into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, which he did. And what he found was nothing. <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. It was a, a raised platform, uh, but that was it. It was going to happen again. Just in 40 short years, excuse me, the Romans were going to march on, on Jerusalem. They were going to lay siege to the city. And then they, they were going to destroy the temple. And they did. Uh, this is a, a historical fact. They tore down the temple one brick at a time. And even one stone laying upon another. That prophecy of Jesus fulfilled perfectly. 
as the Romans dug up some of the bricks in order to get to the gold that had melted down into the crevices. Uh, so uh, when you see this, flee, get out of town. Uh, historical reports tell us the Christians listened to their Lord. And so that's what he's talking about in this, is the destruction of Jerusalem. As I've said before, when it comes to the application of prophecy for us today, although it is not specifically to us, there are principles that are for us today, just like all of the rest of Scripture, which are important when it comes to the judgment of God on nations in time and history. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, but again, all this for another time in more detail. Although, uh, he is talking about the coming of the Son of Man, and the coming, I've done an extensive study on this in adult Sunday Bible class, maybe I need to record that here for posterity, but we looked at a number of the texts of the coming of Yahweh in the Old Testament, and Jesus, an heir to that rich prophetic heritage, leans into that, and uses it, and applies it to himself, these are clear statements of the deity of Christ. He is applying statements that are exclusive to the dominion and the authority of Yahweh in coming and judging nations in time and history. Uh, Isaiah has a number of texts about the coming of Yahweh on Egypt, on Babylon, on Assyria, on Edom, on... I mean, the list goes on and on. Ezekiel has a similar thing. Uh, Jeremiah has some. Uh, they're all over the Old Testament. And then Jesus says, yeah, that, that's, that's true for me too. The coming of the Son of Man, uh, he comes in judgment because he is likewise fully God. Now a lot of this is also, by the way, reinforcing things that we've talked about in the Sunday morning sermons the last couple of weeks. where We looked at the what's called the hypostatic union of the, the, the deity of Christ. He's 100% fully deity, 100% fully human, the humanity of Christ as well. And there is a perfect uh, union of those without mixture, without confusion. And, and, and that uh, nature of the person of Jesus, 100% fully God, 100% fully man, perfectly united in the man, Jesus, uh, who is the Christ. We believe that. That's one of the tenets of our faith, that Jesus is the God-man. Well, there are a number of ways to demonstrate that. This is one of them, right? Here he is. He predicts things, makes prophecy. He applies things that are exclusive to God and uses them for himself. Um, you, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's taken right out of Old Testament scriptures, okay? And he is applying what was exclusive to Yahweh to himself because he is Yahweh incarnate. Uh, he uses a parable here, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. Why? Because his words are ontologically different than any other human's words. Because they're not just words spoken by a human, they are the words of God incarnate. God in the flesh. They are equal to, on the same level as, the words of Yahweh in the Old Testament. That's why his words will not pass away. Once again, all of this emphasizing, the full deity of Christ. But, verse 36, concerning that day and hour. That day and hour is the coming destruction upon Jerusalem. That's the day and hour that's under discussion here. But again, there are principles that shake out the bottom of this when it comes to the day and hour of the end of time. No one knows that. No human being knows when Jesus is going to come back for the final time and bring with him uh, judgment, rewards for his people. So no human, not even the angels of heaven. So now we're getting kind of this uh, spiritual pecking order, as it were, as there's creatures, humans, but then there are creatures that are above us, angels. Not even the angels are privy to this knowledge. And then you have the interesting statement, nor the Son. But the Father only. Um, I'll try to remember to put a link in the description. But Dr. Daniel Wallace, I talked about Daniel Wallace before. This is the guy who uh, was, um, he taught Greek at the collegiate level, 
had written textbooks. His is the great big thick beyond the basics Greek grammar that is required for like second year Greek and all that. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Contracted encephalitis uh, that messed with his memory, forgot all of his Greek, and then had to reteach himself Greek using the textbooks that he had written. Brilliant guy. He's got nearly an hour-long presentation that he presented at Liberty University, one of my alma maters, and he really geeks out on this. And if you want a deep dive, there is uh, a textual variant here when it comes to uh, nor the sun that is significant. And I, I was tracking with his argument, and I believe the argument is that nor the sun is not original to... Matthew, it, it, it can be, but typically Matthew strengthens the affirmations of the deity of Christ. Wallace gives a number of examples uh, in comparison to Mark, say. Um, but even without this, um, if we, let me open up just a second resource. Yeah, here we go. Mark 13.32, but concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, it's interesting the way that this sentence is structured here. Without a doubt, Mark wrote, nor the Son. That is there. That is authentic. However, the way he writes the, the last phrase here, I know it says, but only the Father. Matthew actually strengthens that, and he adds the little word uh, monos, which means only, Mark doesn't have that in, in his gospel. So Wallace's argument is, while Matthew probably did not include this, it was added later, uh, scribally, in order to agree with Mark's gospel, which has no question about it at all. It, it does, nor the Son is there. Matthew, to strengthen the... Because that's what he does in his gospel. He's presenting Christ and his deity and really tamps down on that uh, in a number of places in comparison to Mark, nor the Son may not be authentic to Matthew, but implicitly, by adding the word monos, but the Father only, he is again implicitly making a declaration about the relationship within the Trinity and the Triune God, in terms of coming judgment on Jerusalem. Now, even with all that aside, right, textual variants and all that. You will get folks who do not agree with us about the deity of Christ who will present this verse as a challenge. And even if we want to say there's, there's abundant evidence that it could be original to Matthew. Don't have a problem with that. You can go to Mark. It's there. Okay, So you have to deal with nor the Son. And how do you understand that? the application of the presentation of this verse differs based on who you're talking to. For example, if you're talking with, say, a Jehovah's Witness person who does not believe that Jesus is fully divine, fully God, that he's uh, a created being, first create, creation of the Father, but not God, capital G. They'll come to this verse and say, maybe ask you some questions, like, do you believe that God knows everything? Of course we do. And you believe that Jesus is God, correct? Yes. Then how come there's something he doesn't know? Okay. That is how our Jehovah's Witness friends may approach this text. Our atheist or unbelieving friends will come here, and they want to do all kinds of damage, especially leaning into the, maybe the textual variant aspect of this. That's why you need to know it's here. Okay. It's just to be aware. Okay, fine. But implicitly, the Father only is there. But say like Bart Ehrman in his works, he called this like the, the pinnacle, it's like the premier textual variant that shows uh, there's problems with our Bibles. I'm, I'm holding up a Bible here, by the way, <laughs> off, script, off, off camera. And so we can't trust our Bibles because they've been changed over and over. This was presented to me uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I was studying with a, uh, a young 20-something-year-old uh, a uh, gentleman who really started to lean into that. You know, the Bible's it's, it's been changed. Well, wait a minute, what do, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, because it's been uh, translated so many different times. Whoa, wait a minute. Are we talking about 
the translation of the text, or are we talking about textual transmission? Because those are completely different things. In terms of the transmission of the text, we believe that God has perfectly preserved his word, so that what we have today is exactly what God wants us to have. And there is manuscript tradition that is an embarrassment of riches compared to other works of antiquity. Translation is, well, sometimes, yeah, you do get it where maybe there was a translation from the original languages into another language, and then from that into another language. That's what happened with some of the early English translations back in, say, uh, the 15th, 16th century, is they took a translation based on the original language, Hebrew, Greek, some Aramaic, which was uh, translated into Latin, the Vulgate, through Jerome, which became the Bible for the church for about a thousand years. And then there were subsequent translations made into English and other languages after that, which lends itself to problems. But guess what? If you have questions about the translation, you can go back to the original languages. Ad fontis. That was the cry for uh, the Renaissance. Back to the sources. We can do that. We can go back to the original languages. So this business of translation and all that, don't let uh, that get in the way. And, and really, we need to be clear about what we're talking about exactly. When it comes to this, there is a clear textual tradition, a clear manuscript tradition, that we know there's a textual variant here. And in some of our manuscripts, it's there, and some it's not. You need to just be aware of that. Because, again, our... Atheist neighbors are going to lean into that and say, you can't trust the Bible. Well, actually, yeah, we can. We know which manuscripts have it, which don't. Some translations, the Bahiric, the Syriac, uh, the uh, very interesting, the Diatessaron, which is the one of the Syriac translations, doesn't have Norbison. Just need to be aware of those things. Your Muslim neighbor will latch onto this and say, uh, Allah has no son, and so therefore you're claiming that Jesus is the Son of God, but he doesn't know stuff, right? So they'll, they'll lean into it that way to say Jesus was just a prophet, not, you know, God in the flesh like you're claiming, Christian. It's very interesting because the question I would have back to them is, well, do you believe that Jesus actually said this? And that's where it gets thorny for our Muslim friend because if they say yes... Well, here he is, he's identifying himself as the son of Allah, as, as you would say, right? He's the son of the Father, but you're saying that Allah has no son, and yet you're saying that Jesus actually said this? Hmm. If they say no, then what are we arguing about? You know, it's, you don't even believe he said this in the first place. I have no problem saying, yeah, Matthew could have written it. It's clearly in Mark. So, how do we deal with it? There's a couple of different ways of approaching it. One way that I've heard, I've been guilty of saying this as well. I don't think it's as strong an argument as I once did. One way to approach this is to say, well, um, this is Jesus speaking from his human nature. Remember, we have the, the divine, or the deity, his God nature, and his human nature. He is fully man, right? And so this is Jesus speaking out of his human nature. Problem with that is... If we're going to say, well, the Son means his human nature, you start running into problems with, say, other places in Matthew's Gospel. Because if we're going to try and apply this consistently throughout Matthew's Gospel, well, then you kind of run into an absurdity in verses like Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the human nature except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the human nature of Jesus and anyone to whom the human nature of Jesus chooses to reveal him. Not sure I want to go that route, right? Uh, that, that brings with it some difficulties. Or how about our favorite text in Matthew? One that we probably have memorized. Jesus came to them and said, all, all authority, <clears throat> excuse me, in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the human nature of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. See, again, you start running into problems applying this consistently. That's why I'm not a big fan of, well, this is a human nature thing. This is God the Son, incarnate for sure. Fully divine, fully human. So that's how you have to approach this. So what do we do? 
I think a more consistent way that I think we can harmonize with the rest of Matthew's Gospel and with the rest of the New Testament is to recognize that when it comes to the Incarnation, that this is something that is unique to the Son. It's not the Father who takes on flesh, it's the Son. And as a result of this very unique action from God, it brings with it certain unique aspects for the duration of the life and ministry of Christ. Okay. And then I think there's also a, a theological point to be made in terms of there are certain aspects of the work of the triune God that belong exclusively to one or the other or the other of the Trinity. Like I just said, it's the Son, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, who takes on flesh. In a similar way, it's the Father, and Him only, not the Son or the Spirit, that has this knowledge concerning the day or the hour of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. That within the revealed Trinity, you get certain aspects of it. Now, now, without a doubt, they're in perfect harmony with one another, perfect union with one another in that regard. And so, um, you know, when it comes to the work of atonement, when it comes to the work of judgment, when it comes to any of the works of the triune God, they are in perfect union. But they may take different roles in the administration of that. Historically. Okay. But let's back up and let's go back to um, the incarnation. Because I, I think I think this is really where the rubber meets the road. When God the Son, fully divine, 100 percent fully God, when he takes on flesh, takes to himself that human nature. There were some unique aspects that go along with that. I don't want to say that he gave up certain aspects of his deity. I don't believe that at all. He retained his full godhood even when he took to himself full human nature, flesh. Okay? However, there is, I've talked about it before, you know, I'm... I'm Look it out the window here, and today was a bright sunny day. But uh, there were some clouds in the sky, and sometimes you have the sun and its brilliance, but then a cloud covers the sun. And for a time, the light of the sun is veiled because of this cloud. That doesn't mean that the sun, S-U-N, stops being the sun and stop shining. It just means that that light is veiled for a time. And that's what happens with the incarnation and when it comes to God the Son. He does not stop being fully God. But there are certain aspects that go along with being God in himself that are veiled for a time. For example, we believe that God is omnipresent. He's all places, all time. Uh, there are a number of verses that speak to this. Uh, Psalm 136, 139. I'm doing that off the top of my head. Well, where can I go from your presence? If I go to Sheol, you're there, right? And, and those sorts of things. Omnipresence of God. However, when God the Son takes on flesh, um, for a time, he's located in time and space. about the glory that belongs to the second person of the Godhead. When he shows up on the scene, he's not walking around glowing. Right? He doesn't have that transfiguration glory where the veil of his humanity is pulled back for a moment and the brilliance of his deity comes shining forth in the presence of the apostles. 
He's not walking around like that all the time. Glowing as he walks down the streets of Jerusalem or Nazareth or what have you, right? That glory is veiled for a time. That's, I think, illustrative of what we're seeing here in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 24, 36, Mark's Gospel, which is uh, 13, 32. And that is that in the Incarnation, and, and this is certainly Jesus speaking before the cross, before his resurrection and ascension, that in the Incarnation, there are certain attributes that belong exclusively to deity, which for a time are veiled. And therefore, nor the Son knows that they are the hour. Now, having ascended back to the Father's right hand, does he know now? Well, I mean, he's already executed judgment for the specific application of the destruction of Jerusalem, which this uh, passage is talking about. And so, yeah, of course. Historically, we know that happened. But in terms of like the second coming, the final coming of Christ, does he know now? I believe now that he's returned to glory, I think it's fair to say he probably does. But here, historically, in the incarnation, the Father only knew this information. Now again, theologically, it's interesting there's no mention of the Holy Spirit here. <clears throat> so does the Spirit know? And therefore... Uh, is there an aspect to which uh, this is applicable to the Son concerning the final coming? That right now, the relationship within the Trinity is such that this knowledge is exclusive to the Father in himself, uh, as the, the Trinity has revealed himself. And then you have Kind of a restatement of this here in uh, Acts, written by Luke. It is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Is that what we're to understand here? Is that when Jesus speaks here of the Father knowing, it is speaking to the fact that he has fixed this by his own authority. But again, in the revelation of the Trinity, it is the Father who in his role as the Father, fixes these dates and times and seasons. I don't have a problem with that. That makes sense. Because as we've said, there are certain roles that are taken on as the Trinity reveals, the triune God reveals himself. The certain roles that are taken by each person of the Trinity that are exclusive to that person of the Trinity. Again, it's the Son who takes on flesh. But again, that doesn't mean that they're not in perfect harmony and union with one another in the outworking of those things. And so while the Father may fix the times and the seasons by His own authority, the Son and the Holy Spirit, they may know that in the sense of having knowledge of it, but then also in the execution of times and seasons, they're involved in that. Okay. Put it together, Nick, in, you know, I'm sitting here across the table with... Someone who has just brought this to my attention, whether it's a Jehovah's Witness or uh, an atheist, agnostic, skeptic, whether it's a, a Muslim neighbor of mine, or, or whoever it is, right? And, and they've just brought this to my attention. How can I package this in 60 seconds or less? The context deals with the coming destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus here is making a statement prior to the cross, before his resurrection and subsequent ascension. He is speaking here as the person of the Godhead who took on human nature for a time. And as a result of that, there, there are certain attributes of his deity which are veiled for a time. He's not everywhere all at once, omnipresence. His glory is veiled, but we see it in, say, Matthew chapter 17 with the transfiguration. And so in this case, when it comes to his knowledge, uh, this is God incarnate and 
for a time, that knowledge seems to have been veiled, at least knowledge concerning this specific thing. Also, when it comes to the triune God, I have no problem saying that the Father has fixed this by his own authority, that the Father knows this in his role as the Father, just as the Son has his particular role as the Son in taking on flesh. The Holy Spirit has his role in the regeneration and sanctification of the particular people across time and space. The Trinity, they the three persons, are all one God in perfect harmony and union, but they do have distinct roles which are executed in harmony with and in union with the other persons of the, of the uh, Trinity. Mm, that was almost two minutes. So, uh, shorthand here, but I, I think those are some ways in which to explain this text, which can be, again, uh, used by folks to, uh, to, to challenge, uh, to ask questions, and, and that's all right. I think we ought to have good answers for this. Uh, and, and I think the incarnation and then the roles of the triune God uh, revealed historically, I think, are a couple of good ways in which to deal with that. Spend some time here in prayer. And um, do want to report... Um, that we did get word of the passing of Virginia Yoshino. Um, I'm, I'm looking here at an email from the preacher up at the Ham Lane Church of Christ in Lodi uh, that uh, Virginia went to be with our Lord uh, early this morning. So we want to keep Ernie and uh, Lynn Albro and all the family in our prayers this evening with the passing of Virginia. Okay, right where you are, I want you to invite the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to come and be with you. And as we draw near to God, God draws near to us. Heavenly Father, we marvel at your wisdom. Uh, we marvel at your authority. As we begin this new year, we ask that you create in us clean hearts, that you renew within us right spirits. We pray that by your Holy Spirit within us, that you would sow in us the seeds of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We pray that this new year would be marked by the fruit of the Spirit, and that we would overflow with all of those various Spiritual, uh, Holy Spirit-derived qualities. We come to you this evening and we want to pray on behalf of a number of requests that are here before us. And we're especially mindful this evening of the uh, loss of Virginia Yoshina. We pray that you be with Ernie. We pray that you be with Lynn and the whole family with the passing of Virginia, and also uh, be with the family of Gertrude Smith. These are a couple of long-time sisters, long-time servants in your kingdom, who have now gone on to their reward, and we praise you for that, and yet at the same time we mourn with those who mourn. And as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we pray that you would buoy their spirits, surround them with your abiding presence. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery, for Faith, Katrina, and Cody. We pray that you would speed each of these along toward full recovery. There are several who have been battling COVID. Uh, we pray for the Maganyas, and it was good to see them yesterday. It seems they've made full recovery. The Patons, uh, I believe, have also made similar good recovery, and we give you praise for that. There are various other requests that we want to lift up to you at this time. For Liberty Rust Camp Woods, we pray for... The closing of Traveler's Motel, just a couple short days away. We pray for that uncertainty with some of the residents there. For Ryan Higginbotham, we pray that you strengthen him and encourage him. For Brittany, we pray she would make good decisions. For Christopher Matthew, we pray that you would give him good mental health. Same for John Russell, give him good mental health. Callie also, struggling spiritually. Pray that you lift her spirits. For Greg and Roxanne, we pray that their major health issues would be resolved. For Randy Hatter and Steph, we pray that you be involved. For CJ, we pray that he gets the treatment he needs for kidney failure. For 
Our sister Paula Mueller having a number of issues. We commit all of these to you at this time. For Sam Martinez, we pray that you uh, be with him as he's going through divorce. Uh, good to see our sister Helen yesterday. We pray that you continue to grant her healing. For Melissa Shook, we pray uh, that uh, you would help her with her life struggles. For uh, Evelyn, we pray that you uh, give her steadiness and balance. For Amy Harp, we pray that you help her struggling with addiction. For Roselle Wade, we pray that her blood pressure gets under control. For Vanessa Foxford, we ask that you be involved with the several personal issues that she has. For Sheila Walls, hmm. Hmm. for Sheila, Gary Laguna's neighbor, uh, who's recovering from a stroke, we pray uh, that, that you be involved there, Father. For Mary Benitez, we ask that you uh, grant healing to the kidney infection. For Amelia, we pray that you uh, help her walk with the Lord. For Albert, uh, we pray that he is able to overcome uh, drug ab abuse and break the chains of addiction. For Jerry and Debbie Murray, we pray for their several health concerns. And there are a number who are battling cancer this time that we want to lift up to you by name. Thomas Moore, Greg Hall, uh, Phil's wife, Paul, Joyce, Lynn Brocco, Chris, Jim and Kathy Dixon's sister-in-law, Robert Wooten, Wendy, Yvonne Wheeler, Margaret Diaz, Cindy Lindsay, Michael Patton, Renee, Daryl Christensen, Wayne Knox, Corinne Ruckman, Mike Corley, Cecilia, Rosella Pasley, Susan, Ron Treadway, Dwight McBride, Bruce, Bill Hunt, and Mason. Oh, there's so many here, but we commit them to your uh, personal care. And we pray that where there is sorrow, you would grant joy. Where there is despair, you would grant hope. Where there are doubts, you would grant faith. Where there are upcoming tests, that you would be involved with those, that you'd be with all the doctors and nurses involved, that uh, as well, Father, where uh, according to your sovereign power, you would grant healing as you deem fit. You know, Father, it's so good to know that you'll do even more than we ask or imagine. We commit all this to your loving care. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Abba, we belong to you. We are our beloved's. His desire is for us. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now and forever into the day of eternity, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me this evening on a Monday night. I know there's a lot you can be doing on well, the first Monday night of the year. Uh, indeed, the first day of 2024. Here we are. Happy New Year to you and to yours uh, Hopefully, this is a, a good start to the year for you. And, uh, yeah, I think that's going to do it for me. Uh, Lord willing, buddy, will be with you Thursday evening. Don't forget, midweek service, Wednesday, uh, 7 o'clock in the uh, Fellowship Hall. Or catch the replay on Friday. Yeah, that'll do it for me. Lord bless you, Lord keep you, Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May God richly bless you, my beloved siblings. Until next time, have a good evening. God bless.